Welcome to Globespan. I'm Paul Neal, Tennessee of Guyana. And today we are back again discussing the hot issues of Guyana. Quite recently, a report came out regarding the 2020 elections in Guyana. Uh, the group that conducted, uh, that wrote this report is an electoral integrity group that was created at Queen's University in Canada. And they have been going around the world looking at elections, particularly perception. After an election, they have an expert or experts that look at the elections on a number of criteria, about six, seven or eight of them. And then they come to a conclusion on whether they, they rate it. It's a, 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 a bit like the corruption, anti-corruption index that is done. And Guyana scored very badly uh, because of the 2020 elections. Uh, we scored, I think, was 47. <laughs> and believe it or not, we were just above Venezuela and Haiti, which is incredible. So the question tonight is, why did Guyana get a low score for perception by the Electoral Integrity Group? Um, and the follow-up to that is, it's a two-pronged question or questions. What can be done to end the election strike in Guyana? So those are the two uh, questions we are going to discuss with our three eminent guests. And we have with us uh, Mr. Timothy Jonas, who is a senior counsel attorney at law, chair of a political party in Guyana called Anug. And we have with us uh, attorney at, at law, Mr. Datadin who is also uh, uh, a member of parliament uh, and he's also the chair of the Chedi Jagan International Report, uh, Airport. We also will have with us Mr. Vincent Alexander, who is a commissioner of GCOM. GCOM is the organization that oversees elections in Guyana. And he says he's no longer a member of the PNC, sort of independent, he's retired. I don't believe him so much, but anyhow. Um, but the truth is that he is very knowledgeable about the elections in Guyana and has been in the middle of the 2020 elections. Now, at the end of the program, uh, we will recover a poll which we've set up and we usually do on the program. And there are two questions we ask the audience who would be looking at the program. Do you believe that Guyana will have a verifiable free and fair elections in 2024 or 2025? Uh, does Guyana need a United Nations, the United Nations to conduct its elections independent of government and political parties? So those two questions we are going to pose to the audience who are looking at the program. And at the end, our friend Devin will give us the results of the poll. So gentlemen, let's begin the discussion among the three of you who are extremely knowledgeable about election issues in Guyana. Let's start with Timothy, since you are on the top there with a very nice shirt today. Timothy, why did Guyana get a low score by this group, the Perception Electoral Integrity Group? And um, then we'll move in the second half of the program into what can be done to stop election strife. So let's start with the first question. Timothy? Timothy? I think Tim's frozen, is he? Seems momentarily frozen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on that one. Timothy, are you there? Yeah, I'm hearing you now, Paul. I'm sorry, I so, missed the last thing you said. So I was asking you to be the first person to respond. Why did Guyana get a low score from the for the perception of elect from the perception of electoral integrity group? Why do you believe we got a low score regarding 2020 elections? Because we spent five months figuring out who won the election, bro. Can you can you expand a little bit for our audience? Because some of our people may not know. You know, you've been in it, so. You know the details, but give people a little idea of, of uh, why you think we got the low score in a more, you know, a deeper way. 
All right, there, there are a number of criteria you look at to Wonderful. decide if your election system is fair or not fair. So what are the criteria? You, you want to look at how clear your laws are. If the laws themselves lead to a fair result and a fair democracy. You want to look at the system, the procedure that is followed in terms of voter registration, in terms of ensuring that the people who turn up at the place to vote are the right people, have their IDs, are identified properly. You want to make sure they only vote once, they can't vote twice. Um, so if you have a clean list and you're sure of the identity of the people who are coming to vote, that's a good start. But that's what happens at the elections. You also want to be sure of the run up to the elections that there's fairness. So party funding, how much money do these parties have access to? To spend on campaigning and on getting around the country. Is the incumbent party using state resources? Isuko trucks and helicopters and that kind of thing to get around the country to reach out. How are they treating the citizens? Are they using state resources to offer gifts to various people, outboard motors and tractors and cash handouts? So you have to look at the process before the election to see if the funding for the election and the funding for the campaigning has been fair. You got to look at the freedom of the media, freedom of the press. Do your opponents get a chance to freely access the media, the airwaves, social media and the newsprint to criticize, to express their point of view, to express a different point of view? Um, during the recount process, you remember the media weren't even allowed inside um, the conference center. Do the media have access so that they can make their own investigations and find out the truth? So there are a number of different criteria you have to look at, all of which you try to pull together to satisfy yourself that the system is fair, the list was fair, the process was fair, honest people counted the votes, and a fair result came out transparently. So it's a number of factors. Thank you. Um, Attorney Datadin, MP. How, how, how do you respond to why we got such a low score, for, particularly because of the 2020 election? Well, I have no doubt that the factors that of why we got a low score hinges uh, in large part because of what transpired after the elections in March. Um, it took five months for us to to have a declared result. We have a total electorate, uh, a population of 750,000-800,000 people. We had about 500,000 people voting. I mean, literally, if you had stood in front of your yard and done a show of hands, we would have counted three times by that time. Literally, that would have been the case. In countries like India, where they are where there are more than a billion people and there are hundreds of millions of people, they do an election declaration within 14 days of the of the polls. And they have like nine days of voting and they still declare it within that time. We had a, a, a system where in the in the vote count, the various the 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 I don't want to say the, the machinations, but the process which unfolded, the whole world saw. And the, whole, uh, and the majority of, of, the, of the world and the majority of the free world and the political landscape had comments about what was going on. It, co it couldn't take five months and you have a credible system. So the system became, or the system is open for criticism because on that particular occasion, five months for the declaration was unacceptable. In the end, of course, it worked. In the end, of course, it delivered the result which represented the will of the people. But the, the, the questions that would be asked and the lingering questions are, was our legislation sufficient for what there was and what it faced? 
and in in my humble opinion they there are some changes required but it was by and large it was substantially very clear to people who understood english it was only to people who wanted to convolute the 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 the, the meanings of simple words that we had a problem um, of course it relates to the things that go went on before as uh, mr jonas mentioned it, it, it does look into things like access to state media and whether all the parties had equal access to the state media, the, whether there was equal access to social media and other outlets and the press generally and how that was treated, whether they were, whether all the participants were able to, to get their views out in a, in a fair manner. There is always the issues about how the campaigns were conducted, whether people were afraid to campaign, whether they were uh, threats or, or, or all those sorts of things. As far as I'm aware in the lead up to the elections in 2020, they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't matters of such a nature that we could highlight it or or hold it against it's it's always a system and like every system it's based on the people who are involved and and even in the country as a whole it's based on how how um people react individually not necessarily as part of a political party but their individual reaction but paul make no bones about it it was all about one specific the event five months for the declaration of the results five months of going through that entire process of literally jumping through hoops to make a very simple and straightforward process that should have taken no more than the week to have that addressed and the reason we got a low score is because during that time the people who should, who were charged with the responsibility by law, the constitution and the statutes to discharge functions as public officials did not do their job. That's why we got a low score. The people who owed an obligation to the nation took it upon themselves to not discharge those obligations to the nation and develop partisan agendas. That's what happened. And no system like that will engender confidence. So the low score is really what happened. Thank you. Uh, Vincent, how you respond to the same question? I will respond this way. I, I have the opportunity of witnessing elections overseas, and more particularly in Venezuela, a place where one would think there's tremendous controversy on more than one occasion. Upon visiting a polling station, the appointed electoral official was absent, did not turn up. What they did there and then, to get someone from among the party observers to fill the gap of the missing electoral official. That suggests a certain level of stability, a certain level of trust, a certain level of acceptance of the system in Venezuela. I say that to say that the problem in Guyana is that it's in quite the opposite situation. We have had historically issues surrounding elections, which to my view reflect issues in the society that are sometimes latent and become very uh, evident during the electoral process because of the high stakes 
that elections represent. And given the tremendous decay in terms of our value system, you know, we have a value system in Guyana where people tell you that the corrupt way is the way. And that if you don't do it otherwise, you don't understand life, something is wrong with you. Why do you expect, if we have those problems across the society, that a high-stake activity like an election would not reflect those problems? In particularly given our electoral history, both um, recent and, and not so recent. We have had issues of obvious attempted electoral fraud in 2011. We have had issues of uh, electoral malpractice at the highest level in 2006. We have had issues like an attesto in 2001 of contentions of substitute voting, which was not addressed when brought to the attention of the Commission. And so what would one expect in a society where the antagonisms, antagonistic interrelationships are so high in an election where the stake is also so high against the background of values which seem to embrace corrupt practices as a norm, so that what occurred at our elections, or what is said to be the state of our elections, merely epitomizes the state of our society. And if that was not enough, those of us in charge of the electoral system on one hand, seem not to know what the system really is, and on the other hand, seem to have interests beyond making the system work. Let me explain what I mean by that. There was this complaint for five months, which I think is a misrepresentation of the reality. Was it four? Suffice was it six? This. Suffice to say this. It did take five months. It was a misrepresentation the way we, we present those five months in the public. But it took five Suffice months. I to say this. Everyone has contended <laughs> from a visual perspective that things went pretty okay up to the count in Region 4. I'm not saying everything went okay. But I'm saying from a visual perspective, while you said the system worked, things went okay, up to the counting region four. At the point of the counting region four, there was a parallel exercise undertaken by commissioners to allow those commissioners to be recipients of the statements of hope which if they are recipients of, then they are in fact recipients of the results. Because what we do, we receive the statements, we authenticate those statements, and those authenticated statements are then distributed between the two sets of commissioners and the commission. So there are three authenticated copies of the statements. Of now, if the commissioners receive those authenticated statements, the commissioners are in a position when the report is brought to the commission to determine the veracity or otherwise of that report. And therefore, that's the biggest, the last control point in our electoral system. What happened in 2020 was that commissioners in the context of the things I spoke about earlier, abandoned the exercise. And particularly at the time of the count in Region 4, to intervene in Region 4, 
and therefore deny themselves wittingly, unwittingly, knowingly or unknowingly of the opportunity to be the recipients of the statements of food for that part of the country, which if they had received, and even if a false declaration had been made in Region 4, could have simply been corrected at the level of the commission when the CEO's report was presented in conflict, if it was so presented, to the results with the commissioners should have had in their hands. Thank you. That I is never, the system. I, I never heard that. That system was you. not allowed to work. Yeah, For whatever reason, Vincent, not allowed, I, allowed to work. Vincent, and in fact, if one well, goes back to 2011, it, one can see that that is the system, because in 2011, it is exactly at okay. that point. Uh, Vincent, Vincent, that the let's, correction focus was made. Let's, let's focus on 2020. MP, that then you would you uh, react to what? I, I'm Vincent sorry, said? I'm sorry, but go ahead. But that is the most preposterous. It is factual. There's nothing I, I give him a chance, Vincent. I give you all the time for you to I have it. witnessed, just witnessed, what is only a, another version of an engineered explanation about things for which I am sorry, but we're all, all poorer and we're stupider for having listened to it. This Reimagination of facts. This twisting of stories about what happened in 2001 and 2005. There was no election in 2005, but I might be mistaken. I never said 2005. So and, you're not even listening. Then, but because it's difficult for for me not to even listen. listen to a rather rather. I would challenge you to contradict the fact what, of what I happened. Have said. Is no, it not listen, factual? Listen to me. We were there five months, Mr. Alexander, because basic decisions that should have been taken when the commission should have done its job, it did not. Commissioners abandoned the job. No, 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 no. You say about stop taking. The, SO, the, the statement of polls, you stop allowing yourself to verify. It was the chief elections officer who stopped handing them over to he you. did not stop that. It was stopped because the commissioners were no longer present. So you it see... It was stopped because the commissioners abandoned their posts. Alexander, they thought they could go and rectify what's happening in Region 4, not understanding not how the electoral Alexander, system works. Alexander, if they had stayed in their posts, there would have been a stop. And anything that... that Vincent, give, give, give the exactly. member of parliament an opportunity to respond. Because I was there, and so I know for sure who else was there, and Mr. Gonraj was certainly there when it stopped. Now, we could try to re what was and repaint it any which Let way we finish, want. Vincent. Let him finish. And, and, and we are, keep I give you all the time to present this. This is the kind of thing, Mr. Alexander, that whenever anything came to the commission, yourself would ask for proof of issues and questions that were simply preposterous, beyond your remit, beyond the law, beyond the purview of the Constitution. What are but, you talking about? But you would continue to request... What are you talking about? That, hold on, we'll get to the chapter and verse, Mr. Alexander, but... When you saw a man with a bed sheet and a spreadsheet and you sit there and allow that to happen, what job are you performing as a commissioner? The that law tells you, is, that says you don't understand our system. No, the Mr. system, Alex, the commissioners do not have a role at the district declarations. They do not have a role. I, this is Commissioners why. have a role in the level of the commission when whatever occurs and at the I level of the district you are forward. I listen to and, it. And therefore you are, you are Vincent, giving Vincent, evidence Vincent, in my Vincent, Vincent, Vincent. Mr. Alexander. Let, let's get a chance to section, speak. Uh -huh. Section 84 is very clear. 
the job that should be performed by the returning officer is very clear. The role of the commissioners and the commission vis-a-vis -vis the supervision of everybody in the secretariat is also very clear. Now, if someone is using a spreadsheet and not an SOP, that's unlawful. The court ruled that in Hollandar twice. Now, even when that was being done, what the commission allowed to happen was that a bed sheet be put up that you could not read what was on it and numbers were being put up there and a declaration followed. Now, bearing in mind that these two declarations were days apart and yet the numbers were different. Doesn't that raise anything that how could you claim to have these numbers? You declare it on Thursday as one and uh, declare it on Sunday as another. That is not the let issue for me as, as a commissioner. Vincent, let uh, him finish. Let him finish. Issues no. when those figures are brought before us for a final declaration. The child would have known that. And it doesn't matter how much you whitewash it. It doesn't matter how much you change it. The reality is that the legal obligations and the constitutional obligations of public officials were not discharged. People had the wrong perception. You are quite wrong. Of what? Okay, Vincent, Vincent, Vincent not you have a chance. The district so, Vincent, Where else in the 10 regions Vincent, were they present in the Vincent, 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 can we apply some basic parliamentary rules? I, I give can, you a chance to speak. And how does that mean they misrepresent give, the realities of a Jacob system? Take a pen and make some notes, and I'll give you all the time to respond properly, because we want to educate our audience, both at home and abroad. So go I'm ahead. I'm trying to avoid this education. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is the most naked and unbelievable attempt I have seen to change the facts and to twist the events that took place to make it into something it was not. I am not surprised at all because that is exactly what happened for five months when the whole world was watching. I don't know why persons do not realize that you can keep saying this. You see everybody looks at you. Nobody believes it anymore. People are just fed up of correcting the nonsense anymore. So they let it go on. But there is no doubt as to what happened. The recount demonstrated absolutely and clearly what the results were. And I am sorry if it is beyond your comprehension to see that the, the recount is the accurate reflection of the will of the people. But I, I, will, not, I will not. I will not. You are misrepresenting. I have not said I, anything about the recount. I appreciate that. But I am telling you that I will not entertain that we go back to known facts, known events, and we repaint them and recast them in a different light so they mean something. Okay. We are not all crazy Thank and we are not so mad. Thank you, Sanjeev. I mean, uh, we didn't give, I give Sanjeev a chance. Uh, uh, Vincent, Sanjeev had a chance to respond to you, but Timothy hasn't. Timothy, what is your reaction to the comments of Mr. Alexander and the reaction of Sanjeev to his comments. Are, are we now hearing I'm you? I'm not hearing. Timothy? Timothy? Uh, Vincent describes a system. And the system bears some similarity to the system that I understand. There is a cross-checking procedure, and I'm on the outside having asked questions. I've never been on the out inside like Vincent, so I'm, I'm just speaking as to what I've inquired and learned. And the cross-checking system is that although the legislation says you count at the place of poll and you prepare your statements of poll, and those statements of poll are taken to the central area where they're counted by the regional officer who makes a declaration and then a declaration from each of the 10 regions by the regional officers goes to the chief elections officer who tabulates them and makes the general declaration. In the meantime, 
as I understand it, and in accordance with what Vincent says, the statements of poll are also copied and sent to each of the commissioners. So that theoretically, each of the commissioners will have them and will be able to corroborate what is done by the regional officer going up to the CEO. That, that is what I understand, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I understand Vincent to have said. And as I understand it, that process obtained in 2020 for all the regions except Region 4. And you will remember that Region 4 was the last region where counting, we're not talking recounting, where counting started. And I understand that if Vincent is saying that the PPP commissioners absented themselves and therefore did not get their copies of the SOPs for Region 4, the question I would ask is, you must have got your copies of the SOPs for Region 4. I'm going to step in right there. No, please don't step in yet. No, I just want to interrupt you. I have not you interrupted. Take a note of what he's saying and you'll get all the answers. All right, all right. And I listened to every watch and I did not interrupt and I will not brook interruption of me. Yeah. So if the PPP commissioners absented themselves, but the procedure is you get your SOPs. My question is, isn't it then the case that you immediately knew about the bingo numbers that were being settled? Now, if you immediately knew about the bingo numbers that were being settled, in what time work do you stay silent and say the procedure is that we must allow the Region 4 officer to call all kind of magic numbers to let it go up to the CEO so that he could tabulate all kind of magic numbers because we shouldn't get involved even though we have the SOPs and I personally know it was a set of nonsense going on there. No, that is to answer the procedure that you've described. But I'm also aware having inquired that no SOPs were given to at least half of those commissioners in respect of Region 4. So if there was so if there was a system where commissioners should be getting copies of the SOPs, and that would be an excellent system, and the PPP commissioners did not get copies of the SOPs for Region 4 because they went wherever they went. That part I don't understand because you know where they live in, you know to call them, you know to say we have them here. They couldn't, they couldn't get them, and they have told me. They didn't get them from the people who are in the secretariat at GCOM. And the only possible reason they could not have gotten them is because the rotten secretariat in GCOM, who were staffed at a time to assist one side, saw the problem and broke the system down. And for the next five months, the system continued to be broken down. So my re response can only be, if you were there, and you had the SOPs for Region 4 because you're a commissioner and that's the system, where are they? And if you didn't get the SOPs for Region 4, why were you not crying blue murder since way back when, when you didn't get them and you know the procedure said you should have got them? That's all. Simple. So, Vincent, what's your response specifically? Well, well my response is to, to correct. Two things. Two things. That is what you are saying. Us. Vincent, let me. My response is to correct. Vincent, 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 Vincent. Let, uh, allow me a little bit. The GCOM so, commissioners. On, Vincent. Sorry, you're asking me to speak or? Yeah, yeah, but you're not allowing me to. <laughs> you don't want the moderator to, to say anything you don't want. I you're thought you were asking me the wait question. Bit, wait. Vincent, you're going to have all the time. We're not going anywhere. I'm not leaving the program. Hey, Vincent, there is something very interesting, and you're making breaking news. Um, Timothy is saying he responded to you that, no, first, that didn't respond that this is new news about what happened in 2020 in order to ensure that Region 4, the elections was free, verifiably free and fair. Timothy also has responded to you with respect to that conundrum that you explained a bit about the role of the commission. So what is your response to both of them? Take all your time you need. Thank you. It doesn't need much time. Okay. 
the GCOM commissioners are in collective receipt of the statement of court. They come to us as a collective. We authenticate them as a collective to the extent that we sign off on them as a collective. If any one commission is absent, and particularly in the instance where all of the then opposition commissioners were absent, the commissioners were no longer in receipt of those statements of whole because the system is that they sit, the statements are brought to them, they inspect them collectively. We actually use an ultraviolet ray to ensure that it is a valid statement to whole. Then we signed off. We sign off in a manner that provides for, quote unquote, each side to be present and to sign. And if a side is not present, then no side authenticates and or signs. So the reality is, while it is being suggested that I might have been a recipient of what the PVP was not a recipient of, that is incorrect. Once they absconded from the process, then no statements could have been delivered to the commissioners. And it was not a case where the GCOM operatives did not bring them to us. The statements were sitting there. It was for us to be present, to receive, authenticate, and then to become custodians of copies of those authenticated statements. That system broke down exactly at the time when the conflict was taking place in, on, in Region 4 in relation to the East Coast in particular, an area for which there are other problems which have remained unexplained, so that the GCOM commissioners collectively or individually were not in receipt of the statements of poll for the East Coast and therefore were not in a position to carry out their duty when a report would have been brought to the commission because they did not have the information, which was not denied them, to do the job that they were designated to do. To do. Historically, the district counts are not carried out at the center. They are carried out in district offices, and the commissioners, as far as I know, have never been present at those district courts. What the commissioners do, they go to the center, and as the parallel statements come in, they receive those and they deal with those. In this instance, in this instance, for whatever reason, the commissioners and district four were the same building. And when the persons who were in district four felt that there were problems in District 4, the commissioners abandoned the exercise that they were carrying out to go to District 4, and as a consequence, were no longer in the position they should have been in to authenticate and receive, and that affected all commissioners because the delivery was never to one set of commissioners as opposed to another. So Commissioner Alexander did not have access to the statements to the East Coast as much as no other commissioner had access. But this week, the Commissioner Alexander did not have access because the collective was not assembly. But Commissioner Alexander was there if the collective was to be assembled. Uh, Vincent, uh, I want to raise a point. Oh. Uh, 
Uh, just a minute, and then um, I wrote a booklet that is was widely circulated around the world called "A Case for Free and Fair Elections" between 1968 and 1985, and I experienced also personally as a candidate the 92 elections. I have read the reports of subsequent elections, but I just completed and submitted for publication a 35 pages on the 2020 elections. And Vincent, I reviewed thoroughly, thoroughly, what you had to say about the election, what Nagamoto had to say about the election, what Kemraj had to say about the election, what Harmon had to say about the election, what David Hines had to say about the elections. And Vincent, this is the first time I'm hearing that argument of how the elections could have been free and fair, where you are now positing a role of the of the of the commissioners. Where can I look for that during the election? Any statement by any of the people, including yourself, that I've mentioned? Because I thoroughly reviewed all your statements about that election in order to be able to do an assessment of what happened in 2020. What is your response to that? Two things. Have you ever read my publication, The Case for Non-Delivery? No, I didn't. But I, read I have a publication, the election. Case for the Non-Declaration. Publication which I have lodged when did you, in when did you library. What the date of that? Huh? What was the date? Was it during the 2020 elections or after? No, that was after the elections. Okay. I that, love was a, the, but that was after the election. I want to raise one other point also before so that. So there is that publication. So I'm know, suggesting to you. One other point. Just let me conclude. I'm suggesting to you that you have not reviewed all that I have said. About well, I will, I, I will do that. What I've I said today is not the first time I've seen it. I promise I will do that. But before I invite Timothy and Dr. Dane to come back in, I want to make another observation based on my research. And also implicitly what you said. Uh, it seems to me, and I documented that very clearly, that of all the arguments that I read from all the people I just mentioned in AFC, WPA, yourself and others, Harmon and others, is that the actual results of the election had nothing to do with the election. They were, the, what I read was that there were going to be an Indian takeover and that afro guyanese were going to be threatened, that oil was coming and the PPP will take away all the money, that Venezuela has, uh, uh, America is trying to resolve a problem of Venezuela by intervening in the elections in Guyana. And I documented very clearly the case of whether the elections in Guyana was regime change or international solidarity, because from all the documentation I have on all the people I mentioned, Ramjatan, Nagamutu, uh, Harmon, yourself and others, is that you all objected very strenuously to the role of international observers. So what, I'm tr what you did say implicitly in your opening statement is that there were other issues surrounding the election. And I sort of agree with you. I believe what has been happening is that we're using the election on election day and the election period to deal with issues that has nothing to do with the elections. For example, the race issue. Why don't we deal with it before elections? The problem of uh, distribution of wealth, uh, all the other issues that have been raised. Why is that not prosecuted before the election? Why all the documentation I have has eloquently, eloquently documented a number of extra or extraneous to the election itself and the process, which are economic, social, cultural, ideological, and so forth. So this is a concern I have. Why can't we separate? We have all the time now to 2024, 2025 elections, uh, whichever of those two years there would be elections, to deal with all these other issues and deal with them properly. We don't have to use the election time to be doing that. And I think that is one of the observations that I have made from the study that I just completed. Now, what I, I would, would like I would, to I would agree with you 
I would agree with you. Suffice to say that the way you have couched it is to suggest that there are one set of people who seek to solve a problem at elections time as opposed to another set. But the evidence in relation to what occurred in 2006, I witness, what occurred in 2006 in, in Linden as well, what occurred in 2011, and the fact that there are those people who refuse to address before, during, and now the question of the electoral role is a problem, suggests that you, it is incorrect for you to point your finger at one side. And that is why I said at, my, at the inception that the, the, what is occurring at election time is a reflection of the state of the society. And that reflection is not the responsibility of one side or the other. It's a collective responsibility of the society. So, Timothy, what's your re reaction to that? Are we trying to use election to deal with issues like race, class, economics, uh, nationalism, well, the extent to which, and so forth? The extent uh, to which there is a pervasive view that the outcome of elections determine those matters is the extent to which the values of the society are utilized at election time. Timothy, what's your all view? All sundry. I all okay. sundry. Okay, Timothy, what's your view? And then Sanjay, what's your your view on that? That the way elections are being used. Uh, I, uh, if you look at all the arguments and the, the debate and the discussions, it's like it had nothing to do with the election. It has to do with issues that are prior, you know, before the elections. What is your view on that? Do you have a view on that? The only response I would make to what Vincent says about the procedure is that if you have a procedure that you need all six commissioners there before those commissioners can receive the copies of the SOPs, then you are part and complicit in a, the creation of a system and implementation of a system that is designed to hamstring itself because you have immediately empowered a single commissioner by staying away to mess up the whole thing so that each commission, including Vincent sitting here, can throw up his hands and say with an innocent face, I never saw the SOPs. But I also would point I, out. I'm on record as saying. Okay. 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 Why it is that I can't respond without an interruption, although I afford the courtesy of not interrupting. I can't understand that. I also would like to point out that long after we had Mingo's bingo, the same six commissioners had to meet to agree to a recount. So even if that nonsensical, ridiculous system that would allow one commissioner to mess up the whole baby party by not attending and therefore defeating access by all the other commissioners to the SOPs, even if that did obtain, about which I have my reservations. That obstacle was overcome several times because those same commissioners met all six of them to agree on a recount, agree how to do the recount, agree during the recount. So at that stage and at every last stage thereafter, all six of them were sitting down and could have had access to those same SOPs, but they did not. And there's a reason they did not. Now, we're also forgetting chronological issues. Because at that stage, when everybody said elections went fair, everything was smooth, nobody even mentioned the imagined discrepancies on the East Coast that Vincent now trying to talk about. So that's all I'll say about that. Thank you. Uh, we have to take a break now, and then when we come back, Sanjeev will respond. Uh, we, uh, Devin, let's take the break now and then when we come back, Sanji will respond. Travel Spend has some very cheap fares for July and August to and from Guyana. Seats are limited, but call Travel Spend today for these discounted low fares in July and August. In New York, call 718-845-0437. That's 718-845-0437. In Georgetown, call 227-1701. That's 227-1701. And in Berbice, call 337-4287. 
That's 337-4287. For discounted airfares to and from Guyana, call Travelspan today. Oman! Hey, Oman! Oi! Come that girl, I feel like I see Raymond Ram right across the road somewhere there. Raymond who? Raymond Ram the right there. Sing that girl, Ram the right there. How you pretty so? The 2022 Travel Span Curry Duck Duck Curry Cooking Competition is in Cancun on July 28th to August 1st. Who is going? The duck and the curry going for sure, plus Raymond Ramnarine, Terry G, young upcoming dancer and singer Ariana, Randy Reckless and the Reckless Tassa group. The competition for the best tasting duck is in Cancun for 2022. Friends and families, make this a reunion. Flights available from New York, Florida, Atlanta, Texas, Trinidad, Guyana, Canada or any U.S. states. For more info call Travelspan at 212 in Canada call 6475576200, in Trinidad call Amarils at 6451604, and in Guyana 2271701, or visit us at Travelspan.com. When this wedding got done, right now my belly burning for the seven curry. But then fancy people just call it vegetarian food. I just call it seven curry. Order your 7 curry or vegetarian box today from allfromonesupplier.com and get free shipping throughout the U.S. Somebody make some noise! Let me go! Come join us in the Caribbean getaway. Have some fun in the sun at the Big Light Resort in the DR from August 4 through August 8. Black and white dinner den, karaoke, fun and game, and live entertainment with Super Blue. Hello, this is Super Blue. I will be in Punta Cana from August 4 to August 8. Big style. Kenneth Superset, music by Madman Mary, and more. This is an all inclusive affair. You don't want to miss it. For information, call Allison at 212 243 0865. That's 212 243 0865. Make that call before it's too late. 212 243 0865. Let's get away. Loopsman is back, and we are discussing why did Guyana get a low score for perception of electoral integrity in the 2020 elections and what can be done to end election strife. Uh, we are waiting on Mr. Alexander to return to his chair so that he could hear Mr. Datadin's uh, response to both uh, Timothy and himself. But in order to give a little add to um, Globespan, I would like to say I live in Washington, D.C., and I ordered curry duck, curry chicken, curry potato, and roti all the way from New York, and they sent it to me on the door, and it worked very well. And the price was reasonable. So those Guyanese who, are, <laughs> who don't like to cook like me um, do use the service. It's a very good service. And uh, Globespan sponsors this program, which is very educational. We are waiting on Vincent because I want him to listen what Sanjay has to say. And he's left to bring a document. I was afraid of that and uh, shouldn't have let him go. Um, I should have held him on there. So let's wait a while. I hope he'll be back in a minute. If not, we'll continue. Paul, you had linked a question before the break um, yes. to introduce the question of race. Yes. Could, you, could you tell me what that question was? No, the thing is, when I, the study that I did, the document that I about to publish on the 2020 election, I reviewed all the analysis that were done by the various leaders of the various political parties and 
the various uh, observers in the elections and so forth, CARICOM and so on and so forth. And um, what I discovered, particularly in the case of the PNC AFC leaders, is that the issues that they were raising regarding the elections had nothing to do with the election itself, but it had to do with race, it had to do with class, it had to do with ethnic nationalism, a whole series of issues that were nothing to do with the election and election. And therefore I'm saying, <laughs> you can't use the elections on election day to address those issues. You have to do it now. You have about three or two years in the opposition. You have all the opportunity in the world now to raise those issues and to deal with them. And also from my observation of visiting Guyana, reading and thoroughly following and interviewing people and so forth, I don't believe that the PNC is doing that currently. They are not properly developing policies to address those issues that they raised during the 2020. Hey, Vincent is back. I wish he had. So, and this was a point Vincent was making. He made that in his opening statement that there were other issues. Vincent, I would like you to listen to Datadin, uh, MP Datadin respond, and then we'll proceed. Go ahead, Sanjeev. Well, we told them this system and uh, Mr. Jonas highlighted on it. Now, we're told that what happened and, and the failure of the system was because for some reason, um, all the commissioners were not there. The question would then be, why wasn't that restarted? Why, why wasn't that addressed? Why did we allow Mingo to continue to play Bingo? Bearing in mind, that the Chief Justice had given a very specific order as to what Mingo must do. He disregarded it. The Commission and the Commissioners could have... Why did the, the SOP stop coming to them? If they were not all there, what, they, I know they were all there for several meetings. Why, why wouldn't they, that have been restarted? It, these are the things that keep getting interjected into the historical narrative of what happened that tries to inject into a blame other than where it squarely lay. The GCOM Secretariat was at the time regrettably staffed in an incorrect way, in a way that appeared to favor one side of the political. The Commission is responsible for allowing that to happen, and they should have taken steps. This was a process that was going on night after night. Why did you want, or why did you want to order everyone out of the building? Why did everyone have to leave the building? They were staying there, sitting peacefully with the SOPs, but why they had to leave the building? These are the things that are inexplicable, and those of us who were there wouldn't forget it. And we will not allow the distortion of the fact either. Now, we're told, I mean, for example, the SOPs which Jacob, during all of this, the CEO. Uh, no, but I can just plug in another laptop. I'll do that soon as I'm finished this. Uh, I'll do that. Right. Is it better? Is it better? No. Okay. No, but, uh, but, but the point is still, we, we, we can't rewrite it, and we should have fixed it. It was a simple thing to fix it. If the SOPs were with the CEO, the commission could have said to the CEO, we'd like to see the SOPs. That never happened. These simple things never happened. And what we're hearing now, we're hearing for the first time, and trying to interject facts that weren't there, and trying to put a slant on things, facts that weren't there either. I'm sorry to say that that's 
sad, sad reality of what we see happening here tonight. Um, MP Datadin, try and see if you could sort that noise out so that your what you're saying could be much clearer to the audience. Let's give him a second and then we'll come back to address the second issue because time is going and what can be done to end election election strife because we've been having election strife since political independence. But we'll give Mr. Datadin a minute so that he can be back. Yeah, Sanjeev is back. So Sanjeev, I'm saying we're moving to another to the other part of the question tonight. What can be done? Well, is it better? Is the uh, is the mic fit? Yes, much better. Thank you. Much All better. Right. All right. 100% Perfect. Much better. What, so we are moving to the second question as time is going. What can be done to end election strike? Uh, one thing is, and I mentioned it just now, and this is my input, that we should deal with non-election issues before the election. If we have an issue of power sharing that is of concern to folks in the opposition. If we have a problem of race issues, we have a problem of economic equity and so on and so forth. These issues should be dealt with now. Let's not wait on the day of election. But anyhow, I know that's a two prong situation. We have the actual system itself that has a lot of defects. 2020 clearly demonstrated that. Um, but at the same, and Mr. Alexander is emphasizing some new points about that. But at the same time, we, from all the, the documents that I have reviewed by the AFC leaders and the PNC leaders and the WPA leaders, the arguments they raised had nothing to do with the election itself. It, it, it had to do with other issues which has to be prosecuted for election. But gentlemen, you are the guests on the program. So I ask, what can be done to end election strife? Timothy, what can be done? You might be a presidential candidate next election. What can be done, Mr. Future President of Guyana? Timothy, what can be done? Well, every Guyanese knows the problem. You got two parties. And you got two ethnic demographic groups. And the ones that represent one side vote for their party, the ones that represent the other side vote for their party. And they although they're fifth they're split fifty fifty, the winner take all system means that the party that wins gets all the say, appoints all the people that they want to positions, award all the contracts that they want, has access to all the state funds and state resources. And the other party that also represents 50% gets nothing. That is inherently systemically unfair. And that inherently and systemically leads, because it is unfair, to either side being prepared to cheat. In 2021, I cheated. I saw it. It was barefaced. It was inexcusable and it's not even worth talking about. But oh, let's forget there were previous incidents. So it's on both sides. And unfortunately for PNC, because they're, the demographic of the Afro Guyanese is smaller, they have had a harder time in the unfair system. Now, Unfortunately for the whole of Guyana, both sides have so enjoyed being in power that they have both in turn refused to change what is an inherently unfair system, a system where 50% of the population is excluded no matter who wins. And AFC was the hope that people had to provide a swing to change that and AFC betrayed that trust and that confidence and AFC has now disappeared. And the only hope Guyana can have is another party to come to provide that swing. Because if you only have those two parties, 50% of the country will feel alienated and excluded. And at election time, both sides will do anything. And as Vincent says, 
There's no concept of doing the right thing because the system is unfair. And unlike Venezuela, where you can't tell how a person is voting by looking at them, in Guyana you can. So although I agree with Sanjeev about the secretariat being people unfairly, in any event it would have been people unfairly. It just would have been people unfairly by folks favorable to the other side. And you look at them and you could make an assessment. That is the truth in Guyana. So Vincent, the only solution your... is to remove yeah. the winner take all. It's the only solution. So Vincent, what's your reaction to Timothy's thesis about how <clears throat> we or end election strife in Guyana? Because we've been I, I, I we've been that we can, and so they can be first of all, let me say <laughs> that it's not there's no mission of the fact in this discussion that people were concerned about the voters list and there's an omission of the fact that I prior to the elections repeatedly expressed concern about the possibility of what I refer to as substitute voting instances of possible impersonation those were things that I raised prior to the elections well, what is your reaction to what Timothy said? No, no, I'm coming to that, but I just thought I'd put it on record. Election strike. Because they weren't on the record. Yeah. Now, I feel that there is a possibility of electoral engineering uh, and uh, systems of governance that can be responsive or dilemma. I don't think that we're going to wish away the tribalism. I don't think we're going to wish away the stakes that an election is perceived to be at this point in time. And so in the first half, I think we have to reduce the elections as being the stake it is perceived to be. And one way to do that is by meaningful devolution of authority, using a system of subsidiarity to allow for the devolved bodies to have more authority, and therefore for our enclaves, so to speak, to be able to solve their problems at the local level and therefore reduce the dependence on the national level for the resolution of the problems. And in that regard, reduce the tension and the stake that we experience uh, around a national election. So I believe on one hand, there should be what I would call vertical uh, devolution of power. As much as I also feel that there is a scope for horizontal devolution of power that will provide a cooling off period and a period where we can have the required national conversation about, about Guyana and what values we want to embrace as a nation as, a, as opposed to uh, the ability of people at the family, communal, and other levels to embrace the diversity. So I think that we have to recognize diversity, recognize the political system can be responsive to diversity through the evolution of power, and at the same time, through horizontal uh, power sharing, have a period when we can try to have a conversation about how we deal with the things that are national, which are to a large extent the source of the problem in so far as their distribution um, concern. So for me, there is that need, which I have ad nauseum uh, referred to for vertical devolution and horizontal devolution. And one other thing is the electoral system itself. Whilst it is useful for us to have PR, it is also, I think, useful for us to have real constituencies. Real constituencies. We don't have real constituencies in there. And so we need to go back to the drawing board and the question of the hybrid system. To use the top of votes primarily to bring balance to the results, but to provide for real constituencies 
a greater number of constituencies so that you would create a system of uh, accountability at the level of the parliament and the parliamentarians through a constituency system. So whilst I'm not calling for an absolute force past the post system, I'm calling for a greater level of um, greater amount of constituencies using the top up primarily for that purpose. Our top up doesn't serve the purpose it's intended for. Our top up helps it to start the whole um, the whole system and, and keep us at the majority majoritarian level with a very high stake for um, who wins. If we have a constituency system where individuals can contest, much as parties can contest, over time, I am of the view that this, the, 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 entire, the entire matrix which I'm referring to could provide for a reduction of the uh, national politics being as critical or as important individuals as it is, and therefore uh, could see a different approach to national politics because the people themselves would have an opportunity to exercise much more power at their local level solve their problems at the local level and not to have to look towards tribal politics for the solution of the problems through a central government. Okay, thank you very much. Sanjeev, what's your response to both Timothy and Vincent? <laughs> Paul, some of what I just heard, <laughs> forgive me, but political systems are for the people. They must be simple. I know that if you allow people to come up and allow their imagination to go about whether there's a vertical devolution or a horizontal devolution, I mean, we could be here all day. If you understood all that Mr. Alexander said, uh, Mr. Tennessee, you're a better man than me. But I will tell you, the average citizen when it comes to an electing elite, wants a simple system. They do not want, and it is not in anyone's interest, not in a country like Guyana, where you have a complicated or convoluted system. Let us take exhibit A, Paul. Is 33 the majority of 65? This is a majority. This is a mathematical fact. That was so, we needed to go all the way to the CCJ to be told that. Simple things are, comp if we had anything more complicated in our laws, if our laws were any less uh, demanding than what they would have been, then we may not have made it through that five months with the, right, with the will of the people anymore. So we don't want a system that is convoluted because the people who are overseeing the system are clearly not doing the job that they should do. Now, we have the, we have the other side of the coin. You want a system that is balanced and fair. So you, you got to work it out both ways, but do not embark upon trying to speak to people in a language they cannot understand. As it is in Guyana, presently it's very simple. You get more votes, you win. Now, the question that goes with that is when you win, and the winner take all system that it is, is that to our advantage? Is that to the benefit of the country? Now, the view is, is that Winner take all should be, should not be that winner take all. It should be some level of inclusiveness going on, as spe especially as it relates to the civil service, uh, the public service, public service, the boards, the the constitutional institutions. These are the things that would be um, that that could take place. But we don't need to change the electoral system to do that. We just need to have the laws that constitute how membership is done and how me how the memberships, how they're appointed. We can fix it that way easily. 
Now, there is an argument, and there has always been from time to time you hear in Guyana, an argument about constituencies, and we should go back to the constituency system before it was changed so that an election could have been rigged easier. We were all one big constituency. So before those days, it was we had 17 constituencies, I believe, and there's an argument to go back that way. And if that's the will of the people, then that's what should happen. But Paul, we have to be very careful about what happens in that system. There, there are challenges with constituency systems like the rest of the Caribbean has, for example. One is it only lends itself to two political parties, which from what we're saying and what, what we know in Ghana, we've always had two main parties and that has been seen as a negative. We should have more than two parties. But in countries that do the constituency, even the United States, state by state, um, and you contest each state, if you have more than two parties, it does not work to the will of the people. It never will. Because what happens is if you once you win a, a constituency, the loser of that constituency, those votes are wasted. If you want, I, I hate to use the term, but as the term that's usually referred to, you have the separate thing that if you have as been in the experience of Trinidad, where you have three parties, the third party almost gets no seats because he comes second and third in all of the constituencies, doesn't actually win, but has a following of more than 30% of the electorate. And when you total up across the country, he has more than 26% of the electorate, but he gets no seat in parliament. So 26% of the people have no representation is what happens. You look at the United, and what happened in Trinidad on both those assist, uh, instances where COP, the, the COP ran on their own, they were minority elected governments in terms of the popular vote. The same happened in the United States when Ross Perot won. There was a minority elected, uh, the, first, the popular vote was the minority. Um, Trump and, and Hillary, because of uh, that issue again, it was a minority in terms of the popular vote. So there are challenges with every system. We, we have to accept that. But we can't make the system too complicated that this is how we balance it and this is how we balance it. Because the only way that happens is you have to put people to do that. And Guyana learned in those five months that you can't trust people with simple English, simple rules. But so what you got to conclude on, if you want to deal with everything, as you say, you want to deal with the other issues too. The way to deal with those issues is through the public bodies, uh, the civil servants, the public, uh, the constitutional bodies. We need to strengthen those, strengthen the judiciary. We need to strengthen those. And the system that we come to must be representative of everyone. It must be fair across the board to everyone. And in this system that we have, there, in, there are no wasted votes. There's at least representation in parliament. The other system lend themselves much more, at least from what I have seen and what I have read, um, much more to wasted votes. And they do not lend themselves to three parties. They're really only for two parties. In the United Kingdom, it's, the, it's conservatives and labor. Tories and Labour in the US, there are two main ones. In Canada, there are two main ones. In Guyana, there are two main ones as well. It, it kind of works out that way. And when you go beyond that, if you do the constituencies, they're usually a bigger challenge because you might find that the, the parties always running second or third. They don't get any seats as a result. But when you look at how much people voted for them, it would be a sizable thing. But Paul, to answer what you say, I think the issue is this. Confidence in the electoral system itself will mean that the other issues that we want to talk, that we think would cloud it, would not have its opportunity to raise its head. It is when the system is perceived to be breaking down or not doing its job that we will think of how to make it better. And that's how we will hear views that that introduce all sorts of other, other issues. Our electoral system is simple. 
and its simplicity suits us at this point. But we can make it better if we make the, 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 the other systems, which are the constitutional bodies and the civil service more effective. That would be what I would have thought. Is there any reaction from either of you gentlemen, Timothy or Vincent? Um, it's unfortunate that uh, what I propose seems to be <laughs> something that is extremely complex. First of all, we have to be cognizant of what is the problem. And based on that, we have to seek solutions to the problem. I sense that um, there isn't a mood of recognizing or solution seeking emanating from the last contribution. When I talk about constituencies, I clearly said that we have to enhance the hybrid system. A hybrid system which would provide for small parties, as has occurred recently, to get their fair share because it is not merely constituency based. Top up provides for a party to get votes in keeping with its percentage. And really, there isn't much in terms of what the electorate has to do if one increases the number of constituencies. It's almost the same process in terms of going to the poll and voting. What will be better for the electorate is that in terms of the constituency, he will know for whom he or she is voting. Right now, you don't know who you're voting for. You vote for the tribe. And then the tribe decides who is the, 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 the parliamentarian. So it doesn't, you can live in Timbuktu, and the party can put you to represent Oriala. Accountability is more likely to occur where people are identified with constituencies that they reside in and that they represent. Whilst at the same time, having your top of votes ensure that you don't have the problems referred to in Trinidad and other places where you have a two-party system, essentially. So the, the, the contention completely misses the proposition which which I mean in that Thank regard. you, Vincent. Thank you. When it uh, comes to uh, the it, just let me finish. When it uh, comes to devolution, much of the system as it is in terms of the electoral system can be retained. Devolution in this instance means that you allow the local authority more authority than it presently has. And I know the argument will be that you know, what happens in the local authorities, but things have to be tried and to be allowed to grow and mature so that the local authorities give them more authority in our demographic context can lead to a reduction in tension and eventually to greater comfort in our national systems. When it comes to arguments about the civil service as the place to solve our problems, that's for a different discussion. Okay. That is an uh, we're getting to nine o'clock, and I, Vincent, we're getting to nine. I need to take a break. Devin, what did the poll say to the two questions? Sure. So again, the first question that we asked our audience was, "Do you believe that Guyana can have a verifiable, free, and fair elections in 2024 or 2025?" 76% uh, said yes. 24% said no. And the second question was, does Guyana need the United Nations to conduct its elections independent of government and political parties? 73% uh, said yes, and 27% said no. Very interesting. Uh, gentlemen, uh, so we have just a few minutes left, and the two questions we posed was, why did we get a low score uh, from the electoral integrity uh, body? and what can be done to end the election issue. Uh, I'd like to thank you all very much because uh, it has been uh, a good debate. Um, one of the things I learned from these programs is to listen to the perspectives of the various point of views that are in Guyana of people who are actively engaged. 
and this is useful for our audience both at home and abroad so that we could be better educated about how Vincent thinks, how Sanjay thinks, and how Timothy thinks, and the political movements and social classes that they represent. Because this is very important as we try to become more and more knowledgeable about Guyana. Now, there is no doubt that our people have been suffering from what I call electoral trauma since 1968. We've been having electoral banditry, we've been having fraudulent elections, we've been having free and fair elections now and again, and um, we are now in a kind of conundrum. And uh, so I hope, and this is my strong view, that there are a number of issues which were raised in the middle of, of the elections when it had to do with the actual results that should be dealt with now. You see, one of the problems we have is that we don't have a culture of a liberal democratic system. And most of the political parties in Guyana, especially the two main parties, they were committed to Marxism-Leninism, including WPA. And that had nothing to do with liberal democracy. So we don't have a, a, a culture from political independence to now of political parties that had coherence and coordination. We're in a new era now, and we're in a new time. So we have to do a lot of work on what is liberal democracy. And quite a few points were raised here, the point of the role of local government. Anyhow, I am hoping that uh, the opposition in Guyana, and Vincent is part of that opposition, that the opposition will become more substantial in dealing with qualitative issues that have been compromising or confusing election at election times. Now is the time to deal with it. And when Vincent, you speak about local government, I'm with you 100%. My grandfather was chairman of village council. My father was an overseer. I grew up on local government. I know what it is. And I believe that there's a lot of work to be done there. We could deal with education, crime, and domestic violence, child abuse, a lot of problems down there that could be dealt with. But Vincent, except for tonight, I have not heard from the opposition a clear proposal, policy proposal, as you use the word devolution, a clear proposal of how local government can become more substantial. So I hope that you being in the leadership of the opposition, you can influence them. And Timothy, you also are in the opposition uh, because you have one seat uh, in, in, in the opposition. And I hope that um, that we can can do this. We can be engaged in the kind of discussion. Now, inclusivity is a big is a is a major issue, but we need proposals on how exactly. And you know, I agree we have to do it on the boards and this and that. But it's very middle class. I think it has to be multi class. I think it has to deal with the working class, the middle class, and the elite. But it seems to me sometimes that the political elite of the political parties in power are the ones who are distributing the power according to boards and this and that. And you're not hearing deeper down into the society on how we can substantially move it. But I am really happy to have all three of you on the program. I'm very, very happy for your contribution. And I would like to give a minute each to one of you, each of you, to make a statement of what you would like to say about the election system in Guyana, but very briefly, because we only have about three minutes to go. So Timothy, I'll start with you, since you happen to be at the top there with that nice shirt, and you have a wristwatch, I don't know if it's gold. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, it's, it's interesting what you said, that when you listen to speakers on your program, you realize there are a lot of similarities. Because interestingly enough, the last two comments, one by Sanjeev, one from Vincent, I saw a lot of similarities in them. Sanjeev, I, I respectfully agree with when he says that small parties can be handicapped if you just have a constituency system. But I, I do agree with Vincent that that handicap is immediately overcome when you have the top-up system as well. And what Vincent was saying about 
the need for a real constituency. So recognizing who represents your constituency is something that's completely absent in Guyana and should be corrected. I think that um, Vincent missed equally the, the point Sanjeev was making that the winner take all can be diluted and there can be some degree of inclusivity when you apply it at the level of the boards and the constitutional agencies and the statutory bodies. And for a while, Sanjeev sounded like a, an analog supporter because I have been beating that drum for a long time. What I think both of them missed though, and, and allow me to say that both of their contributions, I, I think in the last statements they made, reflect a recognition of the unhealthy nature of our tribal politics. But that recognition comes from two men who are steeped in the same tribal politics and are part and parcel and participating within the tribal politics. So you can't fight it from within. You cannot do that. There is a reason that one individual will never support the other side because the other side represents, rightly or wrongly, the perception is that they represent institutional racism. And that applies to both sides. Each side will say, my party is not racist, we're inclusive, we got all races on board. And the reality is both parties represent and are perceived to represent institutionalized racism, which in itself is such a bad thing that you almost have a moral duty to reject it. And that's our trap. Our trap is to look within and recognize that the only way to fight it is to stay away from both. It's 9.01, guys. Vincent, very quickly, we fast the hour, but take a minute and your last reflection. On this. Well, my position so, is wisdom, uh, thought of wisdom here. that one cannot solve problems unless one is able to identify them. I think that one that the problems we have in Guyana is in denial uh -huh. of what the problem actually is. And due to that denial, we do not have the process of problem identification and then move into the next stage of problem solving. I have sought in tonight's uh, uh, program to be factual and not to be opinionated, and to say what actually occurred or did not occur. Fact of the matter is that if things had happened differently, then you would not have had that five months. Suffice to say that the five months was largely spent on a recount agreed to my both parties. And now well, the five months seems to be. Well, let's not go back there. Just give me on, your reflection. So the point I'm making is that we ought yeah. to be factual in, in what we what Well, we you say, know, we've been doing fact check fact stuff. Fact what check what has now become a very a big phenomenon globally in the media in particular. Fact check, fact check, fact check. Okay. Everybody is giving their facts. Dr. Jagan used to say there's statistics and statistics. Sanjeev, what is your last word of wisdom for our audience on the elections in Guyana? I, I would say that, look, the elections, we need some changes in law, which is, um, it's been circulated, so it's going to be coming. We need the people who are there to do the job that the law prescribes that they do, and there must be severe penalties in my mind for those who are public officials who will not do it, and for those who will obstruct, and for those who will facilitate the wrong things. There must be penalties for that, and that can be achieved. As it relates to, to the inclusiveness, uh, the Irfan Ali-led government has appointed members to their boards from other political parties and other political persuasion which is a step in the direction of inclusivity, which is what I was saying, it, it should happen. Because you see, I believe that in a system, the person who faces the, the, the party, the politicians who face the electorate, they must be answerable to the electorate. So it means that the government president must retain a certain amount of control. And it can't be devolved to, to, to so-called civic societies, etc., because they have their own agendas and they never face the electorate. And I believe that those who face the electorate should have it. But it also 
allows for the boards of public corporations, the constitutional bodies, the judiciary. It allows for inclusivity in the selection or the appointment of persons to that. And that should also take place. But I am in favor of a very simple system. Whatever system comes up in the end must be simple and it must not allow for wasting of votes. Meaning, as, as with Mr. Jonas's party and uh, Mr. Schumann's party, they came together because they realized that coming together will give them the necessary tools or the, or the necessary votes so that they would have a seat in parliament and that should happen more. The smaller parties need to learn that that's the process. That That's the blueprint that came out of 2020 that I hope many more learn. Um, the blueprint of 2020 had nothing to do with race. There was one side trying to thwart the will of the people and everybody else lined up on the other side. All the political parties of all the political persuasion. So they're still hoping, Guyana, whatever is, what, what is right, people are still standing up for it. And, and that's why the system must reflect the will of the people, whatever is their will. That's what the system must reflect. Well, gentlemen, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And um, until next time, when I moderate another program, I usually do it one Wednesday, third Wednesday every month. I look forward for us to continue engaging in this kind of discussion. Sanjeev just raised a question of the role of civil society, and that's an important issue about, about that we should attend to, and there are many other issues. So I look forward to us continue having a, a discussion, but listening to each other in a time of great polarization. So until next time, I'm Paul Newell Tennessee for Globespan.